Right. Well, today um, I'd like to talk about chapter 11. We finished chapter 10 speaking about the Australopithecines and what uh, took place um, from about 4 million to about 1 million years ago in terms of the speciation uh, within this genus, this broad genus. And I'll just remind you that uh, there were the robust Australopithecines, which were more specialized in eating hard-shelled seeds and nuts and grasses uh, in a savanna environment, um, primarily. And the gracile Australopithecines, which were more generalized, uh, did not invest as many physiological resources into these specialized, this specialized toolkit for eating these hard-shelled seeds and grasses. So neither of them originally were selecting uh, natural selection was not selecting features like a big brain. Uh, so we saw the emergence of uh, the upright walking, and that's consistent with all hominins, uh, including Australopithecines. By the time you get to Australopithecus, they're all well adapted to upright walking uh, most of the time. Uh, the other thing is that because the diet was changing, the teeth were changing. And so the canines uh, started to reduce and, and no longer were honing. But so far, none of these changes are anything that probably strike you as particularly human. Apart from the walking, which no other ape walks, we've already seen that there were lots of hominins that walked, different species. Um, so whatever that, uh, the, the purpose of that was, um, uh, which we've talked about some of the reasons for that before, um, that seems to be a physiological adaptation. Same with the, the teeth. It's a physiological adaptation. It wasn't until the very end of last chapter that I started mentioning that suddenly the brain was starting to get selected. And this was because the uh, gracile australopithecines started to use tools and the first of these tools the earliest tools we have dating from about 2.6 million years ago uh, were what we call Olduwan and this is named after Olduvai Gorge uh, so these Olduwan tools were pebble tools and uh, all they were was imagine you are a, a, a chimpanzee walking through the landscape and you cut your foot on a sharp, broken rock. You know enough, you have enough sense to realize avoid sharp rocks and don't cut yourself. Even a chimpanzee with a 350cc brain can figure that out. Most animals can. It doesn't require a big brain to, un to actually identify something is sharp and it will cut you. But it's another leap to A, have the sort of Manipulate, be ability to manipulate things with your hands like primates can. Um, and then also to not just identify for your own per personal safety to avoid sharp rocks, but to actually have the idea, I can use that sharp rock to cut something else. Now, can a chimpanzee, a modern chimpanzee do that? Yes, we can see that they make little stabby sticks and they poke at little animals and 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 kill them to eat them. So they they use tools. We know that chimpanzees are clever enough. So Australopithecus garhi, which is associated uh, with the earliest tools that we found, probably didn't have a lot more smarts than a chimpanzee does. And in fact, their brains weren't uh, were about the size of a a gorilla in a chimpanzee body. So maybe a little bit smarter than a chimpanzee, but not much. But they didn't just pick up a sharp, sharp stone that existed. They had the intelligence to be able to say, I can manipulate a, a pebble. I can take some chips out of it and I can replicate this natural process of, break, of stone breaking and make one on the spot for my purposes. Now, it doesn't appear that they were hunting, but as a generalist, Australopithecus garhi was able to exploit a particular food source that is scavenged meat, 
uh, by getting it off the bone and maybe crushing the bones open to get at the marrow, which is a very valuable food source. So once you have the, not just a big enough brain, but the the use of that brain towards creating tools and using them to get food, then natural selection is rewarding that behavior. So having a bigger brain to make tools that allow you to get better food is an, an, an adaptive advantage, which means that natural selection is going to select that brain going into the future, and maybe even a better brain. Now, it might be a slow process because brains are extremely expensive organs. They take up 20% of your daily expenditure of energy every day is just your brain idling. So uh, nature is going to resist um, and push back from developing a, an expensive organ if it can avoid that. But, so if you get, if you get a big brain, it had better pay off for you. It had better get you more energy, more nutrition than if you didn't have that brain. So here today in chapter 11, I'd like to talk about some of the next steps and this development of how the brain started going from just clever enough to be able to make a tool uh, that we know Australopithecines were able to do into more complex uh, um, tool use, but some of the other factors that we consider to be humans. And so this brings us to our genus, in fact, Homo. We're out of the Australopithecines, and you saw that the, the earliest of the Homo um, uh, species was Habilis. We talked a little bit about them. They used the same kind of tools as Australopithecus garhi. So these Oldowan tools were being used by our genus as well in the earliest days, in about 2 million BC, 1.9 or 2 million BC, or, sorry, BP, before present. Your book starts off talking about um, what we're really going to focus on today, however, by talking a little bit about the history of what we know about um, human evolution. And there was, had to have been a first fossil that was found. Now, the first actual human ancestor fossil or human uh, hominin fossil ever found was a Neanderthal. Um, but at the time it was found, it was sort of dismissed as being pathology in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a human. And not everyone agreed that it was another species. Um, so let's leave aside that first Neanderthal fossil that was found and talk about the impact that Darwin's um, uh, book, that, another book that he published called The Descent of Man, where he talked a little bit about um, humans, human evolution. And this uh, really influenced a lot of biologists, uh, one of which was Ernst Haeckel, a German um, uh, uh, physical anthropologist who agreed with Darwin, thought that his book was very good, but Darwin put forth that he thought that the we should look to human ancestry in Africa. Now, I've, I've mentioned before that there's apes found all across the New World. Uh, they're in Africa. They're in Asia. And so why Africa? When you don't have DNA, when you don't have any fossils, when you don't have any evidence, it could be any of these places that you find apes or even elsewhere. So people were sort of wondering in these early days, where should we look? Where should we look for human ancestors? Where should we look for fossils? And Haeckel was of the mind that we should start looking in Asia. He thought orangutans had more similarities than chimpanzees uh, physiologically. Um, and he ended up being wrong, but it influenced um, a, a young Dutch anatomist named Eugene Dubois, uh, who was from, he was Dutch, and at the time the island of Java in Indo now Indonesia was a Dutch colony. And so he moved, uh, Eugene Dubois moved to Java, uh, which was part of his colonial empire at the time uh, as, a, as a Dutch citizen. And uh, he moved to the banks of the Solo River near a village called Trinil, and he went looking for fossils. And he found a tooth, a partial skull, and a femur. And 
Ernst Haeckel, who had written about possibility of finding human ancestors in, uh, in Asia, had already said, we should be looking for something transitional. I talked a little bit about transitions before. And so he said, he actually had already named, even before the fossils were found, uh, Ernst Haeckel had named what we would find. And he called it Pithecanthropus erectus, which means standing ape man. Now, uh, it's pretty bold to say we've, you know, I've named whatever you're going to find. It's, uh, but uh, Dubois, actually, who had read Haeckel, when he found this, um, it, he saw that it had um, characteristics that were neither ape nor human. It was somewhere about halfway in between. The femur showed an upright walker. Uh, the tooth was small, like, smaller like ours, not like a, an Australopithecus. And the skull showed that it was about a thousand cc's. And that's about halfway between a chimpanzee and a human, which is about 1450, 1500 cc's, and a chimpanzee is about 30, 350, 400 cc's. So we're right in the middle there. An upright walker, uh, with actually pretty tall, um, and but a smaller brain than humans, but not an ape. And so this, actually, this nomenclature kind of fit Pithecanthropus erectus, and it seemed at the time to verify what Ernst Haeckel and Eugene Dubois thought, which is that human origins would be found in Asia. Well. They were right about a lot, but they were also wrong about some things. So Pithecanthropus erectus is not the name we use for it anymore. We now know that Pithecanthropus, and so you can just put that out, you don't can stop taking notes on that, um, that is no longer the name that we use. It's Homo erectus that they found, that, that Eugene Dubois found Homo erectus. And it really is, um, uh, we're going to look at the development of Homo erectus. It is a remark, there were some remarkable changes that took place. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to start looking a little bit more familiar to you, a little bit more human-like. We're getting closer in time, and we're getting closer in evolutionary development to humans. They're not humans, they're not us, but you're, we're going to see some of the ways that these other transformations take place where the brain starts to get selected as the, the evolutionary uh, tool of choice, and uh, Homo erectus puts it to great use. So, why are they wrong about Asia? Why, why are, is that, this not where we um, should look for human ancestry? Well, because this was the first fossil, and we now have other fossils, a lot of other fossils, of Homo erectus and other creatures that show that this is actually part of a much longer process. So they got a snapshot, they didn't get the whole picture. And this fits into, their picture in Indonesia fits into what we now understand about this, the origin and spread of Homo erectus. So let's talk about that. Um, so we need to understand what the characteristics of the genus Homo are. And we need to look at where the earliest evidence for this genus can be found. And then what are the trends in evolution? What happens both physiologically and behaviorally? Um, where do we find these as well? So how do you identify a homo fossil, someone in our genus? Well, um, you, you look for things like tool use and larger brain size, which I've talked a little bit about already. Also, that smaller tooth anatomy means that we're getting more generalized to stru tooth structures and we're not eating those hard-shelled seeds and grasses, and we're eating a little bit more meat, uh, which is a very rich food source. Um, so we don't have specialized meat-eating teeth. We have generalized teeth that include the ability to eat meat. Um, also, upright walking is something that uh, um, we see. But a lot of the body types aren't necessarily indicative of, of, uh, of Homo genus, our genus, because the first uh, that we call Homo is, um, is uh, Homo habilis. That literally means handyman. And for a long time, we thought that Homo habilis was the first to use these Olduan tools because they're found in abundance 
at every Homo habilis site you find these Oldowan tools, these very simple, basic uh, replicas of things that you find in nature but made by chipping flakes off of a pebble then used as hand axes or choppers or, or, or uh, um, uh, smashing tools. So this was from about 2.5 uh, to about 1 million years ago you find uh, evidence for uh, Homo habilis. And uh, you get the uh, increased brain size uh, you get increased use of material culture, and you get those smaller teeth. But Homo habilis had not a, a, a adapted a body like ours. Their bodies were smaller, um, and uh, their proportionality they, was different. So they had longer uh, forearms. They had longer arms um, than proportional to their legs, and they're much smaller, more compact. So uh, they hadn't really changed their body type. Um, an interesting sort of side thing that was uh, that doesn't really fit into this picture, um, but is interesting inform information, because if you remember last chapter we talked about uh, the South African species of robust and gracile, including the gracile uh, um, species Australopithecus sediba. They don't really fit into our picture of the human development, but it looks like different regions in Africa were developing different trajectories. And it looks like there is a Homo species that emerged separately from this South African uh, uh, group, although that is up to some debate. They might have moved from uh, East Africa into South Africa, that's possible, but it doesn't seem like um, they fit very well with what we understand. And a different trajectory is that Homo naledi, uh, uh, which is from Rising Star Cave in South Africa, Homo naledi, um, we've got a lot of information, 1,500 fossils, at least 15 individuals. Uh, we show, show that they had a, a sagittal keel uh, that is not a sagittal crest because the, the muscle doesn't attach to that. It's sort of like an osteoblast. It's built up, uh, built up bone through usage, uh, probably for uh, chewing things. Um, they have a very large brow ridge. They have reduced tooth size, like you would expect from Homo, but they have a very small brain size. Uh, and we don't really have any um, uh, tool use associated with them. So some of the features that we would associate with Homo are found in South Africa as well but it seems to be a different branch going, going off from a, uh, a, maybe even a different uh, Australopithecus ancestor. Um, There's an interesting aside because uh, it, your book tells a little bit about how this was discovered and uh, the Rising Star Cave in um, South Africa is extremely difficult to navigate. Um, there are uh, some very challenging spelunking that needs to be done, so much that uh, you had to actually be a particular body size to even get into the cave to do the excavation, which means, uh, for instance, some of the tight spaces were only seven inches uh, tall or wide in places. Um, so I couldn't fit in that. <laughs> I'm, I'm more than seven inches thick. Every single person who excavated this was a female. Uh, because they tended to be smaller, and so it was only females that had experience in both spelunking and climbing, because some of these were almost near vertical uh, shafts that they had to climb through. Um, so six, six females were the excavators of this uh, that were able to reach that site. Okay, so where do we find the earliest evidence of Homo erectus? We find this in uh, in... Africa. So this is where we were actually picking up a very slightly later uh, Homo erectus um, in... So let me reel back there. So Homo habilis is where we find the first Homo, and then we have another species that starts to emerge, which is Homo erectus. And Homo erectus has, it has some big changes that take place. This is when uh, the effects of having a bigger brain and being able to use it effectively seem to really ch start to change the physiology of uh, Homo. Um, so they have an um, even much larger brain than Homo habilis. 
Uh, they have smaller back teeth in particular. They have a longer, low, uh, thick skull with small chewing muscles, so they're not uh, emphasizing that the eating the hard-shelled uh, seeds and grasses. A large brow ridge, but they had longer legs, so they were taller. Some of them perhaps up to uh, about six feet in, t in height, maybe even slightly larger, taller than humans' average height. Um, but not by a huge margin, but uh, comparable. Um, and they had increased body size and also increased tool usage. So their lives became dependent upon tool usage. It wasn't just their physical features that they were living, uh, using uh, to live with. They were extending what their bodies could do by creating a whole range of tools. Uh, we'll meet the most important of those tools, which is the, the so-called Acheulean hand axe, in a moment. And the earliest evidence that we have for Homo erectus comes from a uh, Africa um, from about 1.8 million years ago. Uh, the earliest, uh, one, one of the, an early, uh, very well preserved skeleton of uh, Homo erectus in Af Africa is, called, is from Nario Kotome. Uh, it's about 1.6 million years ago, and it's really, really remarkably complete. And uh, the, if you look at the, the picture in the slides that you've got on canvas or in your book, uh, you'll see that the, leave aside the skull for a moment, which doesn't look particularly human-like, um, the body is almost identical to a human's. Um, the proportionality, the orientation, this is a, uh, the, the double arched foot, everything is really, the body type is, this is when we start to get human-like bodies, is with, uh, with Homo erectus. Um, and the uh, the brain of Nario Kotome um, is about 900 cc's, and um, <clears throat> it's so this is about halfway between uh, a a, a, um, a chimpanzee and a an average human. Now, so 900 between 350 and 1400 or so modern human. Um, Homo habilis, by contrast, is 600 cc's. So you're getting up to 900, maybe 1,000 cc's uh, between Homo habilis and Homo erectus. That just show, demonstrates how important the brain is being uh, for the survival of Homo erectus. Um, now, with that bigger brain, you, you have to do some trade-offs, right? So in addition to being an expensive organ once you're an adult and you're, you're surviving on your own.